Oh, are we recording? Great, perfect. All right, hi everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on shifting the paradigm of research evidence generation for technology-based interventions. This is a two-part series in today's part one. So I'd first like to give an introduction on the Pearl Project who are hosting this um, webinar. The Pearl Network is a community of practice based on disability inclusive development research, including researchers and, other, um, and others from around the world in a range of places in the global north and the global south. The Pearl Network is one part of the three-year SSHRC funded Pearl Project. And now today I'd like to um, introduce our great topic, which is our presenter, which is Dr. Rosalie Wang. So Dr. Rosalie Wang um, is an assistant professor in the Department of Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy at University of Toronto. She is an affiliate scientist at Toronto Rehabilitation Institute and a member of their AI and robotics and rehabilitation team. Dr. Wang's research focuses on developing and implementing technology to enable daily activity participation and social inclusion of seniors. She leads research in robotics for post-stroke rehabilitation and on using information and communication technologies by seniors with cognitive impairments. As an age well investigator, she co-led a national project on enhancing equitable access to assistive technologies. So thank you everyone for joining. Um, we're really excited for today's series, which is based on Dr. Um, Rosalie Wang's work. So yeah, let's, uh, let's start today's webinar. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much, Laiba, for the introduction. And um, I am absolutely thrilled to be here today uh, talking about the work we've been uh, doing, looking at um, processes and methodology for methodology uh, for the development and evaluation of technology-based interventions. And of course, the topic here is um, seeing whether or not we can shift the paradigm um, of our current practices. And um, uh, I'm really excited to discuss this topic, um, just thinking about, um, you know, so far it's been, it's resonated with quite a few people around the world, and so we're excited to um, hear your perspectives as well, and um, hopefully you can share some of your insights about evidence generation and the work that you do, um, and where this topic might potentially resonate with you, and also hopefully to get some feedback from you so that we can expand our thinking, and also to enhance um, our practices ultimately. So um, I do welcome questions, um, um, if you have them, and and um, I will be taking a couple of breaks um, after each section of the talk today uh, to address any questions that people might have, um, but also feel free to include questions in the chat as well. So um, now, so Laiba has given you an introduction about myself. Um, and so I will quickly just look at uh, some of the objectives that um, I would like uh, to be able to achieve today. And firstly, it is uh, to discuss the importance of evidence-based practice and why uh, aspects of these approaches for generating high quality research evidence um, might be inappropriate. Um, also describe uh, FASTER, which is um, um, a framework for accelerated and systematic technology-based intervention development and evaluation research, and quickly review some of its guiding principles as an alternative approach for generating evidence, and also to be able to identify some opportunities for further discussion and application of alternative approaches. Um, before I begin talking about um, evidence-based practice in technology-based interventions, I wanted to give you a brief overview of um, our FASTER collective. And so um, we are an international group aimed uh, to stimulate discussion, adoption, and promotion of the use of alternative approaches to generate evidence for technology-based interventions applied in disability and rehabilitation, and also to advance the development and application of FASTER. My apologies about the dog. 
um, so we are um, an international group comprising academic researchers, rehabilitation clinicians, engineers, and technology developers driven to improve and advance the integration of technology-based interventions into practice and generate positive impact for people and society. And so here we have um, just uh, a snapshot of um, some of the members of our collective. And so you can see myself and Pooja Vishwanathan, who hopefully will be speaking with you uh, next year about her experiences. Um, she is the industry lead uh, for the FASTER Collective, and I'm the academic lead. And uh, she will probably be talking about um, experiences with uh, startups and um, evidence related to um, startup technologies and how that has evolved. Um, we also have Lisa Kenyon, who's at Grand Valley State University. She's a physiotherapist. Kathy Magilton, who is a nurse, um, and she is a senior scientist at Toronto Rehabilitation Institute. Uh, Bill Miller, who's an occupational therapist at the University of British Columbia. Nina Hovenens, who is the clinical lead at Toronto Rehab at the um, Upper Extremity Clinic. And Jennifer Boger, who is an engineer, and she is an adjunct um, assistant professor um, at Waterloo. Julie Robillard, who is an assistant professor at the University of British Columbia. Stephen Charnick, who is a associate professor at Memorial University. And Erin Yerkowicz, who is a postdoctoral research fellow at Imperial College in England. So um, without um, going into much more detail about our collective, um, I'd also like to say if you would like further details, um, you can visit our website um, at www.faster-collective.com. So in this slide, we have um, a snapshot of our uh, paper that's published in Archives of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. Um, so the title of the paper, uh, for anybody who wants to look um, into it a bit further, um, the time is now, a faster approach to generate research evidence for technology-based interventions in the field of disability and rehabilitation. And um, on the uh, other side of the slide here, we have just um, the um, graphical abstract that was uh, for the paper depicting um, the three phases within our uh, framework and also looking at um, the progression of the different phases and the iterative aspects between the phases and also four guiding principles that we will dive into a little bit more later on um, but just so that we can um, I can describe the image to you here um, at the core of the three phases um, is user engagement collaboration um, and ethical processes which are uh, conceptualized as as being at the heart of the three development um, evaluation and implementation phases and should be integrated throughout all of these different processes. And um, outside of the phases and the core guiding principles is another guiding principle that we um, have termed process evaluation and reporting. And that is a um, uh, an element of uh, the framework that we think is critical, um, but it, exterior to the processes and looking at um, evaluation of how we're doing in terms of the uh, development uh, evaluation and implementation processes. So, so just um, to briefly sketch out the aims of the FASTER paper, um, firstly, we wanted to advocate for the use of alternative approaches to generating evidence and the development and evaluation of technology-based interventions, and also to propose an alternative alternative framework and guiding principles. Um, but I think most importantly, it really is to stimulate action by multiple disciplines and sectors to discuss, adopt, and promote alternative approaches when appropriate. So um, what are we talking about when we are talking about technology-based interventions? And so these interventions um, involve technology products or services and often um, have associated therapy practices, training, and other supports. Um, these are often considered as complex interventions, and these interventions may serve rehabilitative, assistive, or service delivery functions. So on this um, slide here, um, I've outlined um, some examples of rehabilitative assistive and service delivery types of interventions. And as you can see, some of them um, sort of are at the borders of these different categories. And so for rehabilitative um, 
intervention, there's an upper extremity exoskeleton helping somebody to retrain their motor function um, after, for example, a stroke. And sort of in between rehabilitative and assistive, we may have um, assistive robots and um, um, also exoskeletons that might be supporting somebody to develop the capacity, uh, for example, for walking, um, but also potentially would be assisting somebody who um, uh, who has lost some ability to be able to walk to um, be able to walk in their daily life uh, better and um, so in the assistive function of uh, some of the robots um, might be um, in this case um, it's a now robot interacting with a little boy um, it's really looking at uh, potentially social interactions um, potentially to develop social skills, but also potentially to um, serve potentially as um, a companion for the little boy. Um, in the next image here, we also have um, the Jacko robot, which is um, an upper extremity um, assistive robot, um, essentially uh, helping to uh, manipulate, grab and reach for different items um, in the environment to assist somebody in their daily activities. Um, in terms of service delivery robots um, or technologies or interventions, um, we have a device called the LEQ, which is a tabletop device that provides information, assists somebody with um, a lot of different daily activities. Um, um, uh, so potentially seeking, helping somebody to find information about something on the internet, also providing um, instructions for different activities um, and a lot of other different types of functions. And um, the final image related to service delivery is a telepresence robot that allows somebody to um, uh, be uh, remotely um, operating a robot um, but have a sense of presence in a different space to be able to provide uh, different sort of consultative services for example and other um, interactions so that is um, in a nutshell some of the things that we're um, calling technology-based interventions so this next slide is really uh, just uh, conceptualizing um, technology-based interventions as complex interventions. And um, again, as a complex intervention, we don't expect a technology to solve all of our problems. Um, it's often coupled or needing to be coupled with um, education and training to be able to optimize uh, their use and efficacy. Um, but social supports are also extremely important uh, to allow somebody to make the best use of their technologies and that may include some of the things like repairs and servicing and um, uh, maintenance as well and um, also um, particularly with rehabilitation technologies therapy practices that are included um, within that intervention that involves the technology so um, why do we need uh, the faster um, so we believe that uh, we need a fundamental shift in how we generate evidence in technology-based interventions in disability and rehabilitation. And we also need to reconsider what is defined as high quality evidence in our um, field, and also to support, uh, better support the integration of these interventions into practice, um, particularly when technology is rapidly evolving. So um, many of you are very familiar with um, current approaches in disability and rehabilitation that are grounded in evidence-based practice, um, which stresses that um, clinical reasoning, which stresses that clinical reasoning integrates with the best available research evidence and client values and preferences and clinical expertise. So that all of these elements of evidence-based practice are um, um, not in debate at this point, but um, what we do have concerns with are things like the hierarchy of evidence quality, which often places um, um, randomized control trials um, as the gold standard or the criterion standard. And um, the highest standard is systematic reviews and meta-analyses of randomized control trials. So, of course, the randomized control trial is um, uh, viewed as the most scientifically rigorous uh, type of evidence um, on intervention effectiveness. And um, apologies for that. And um, the, of course, the highest uh, standard of evidence comes from systematic reviews and meta-analyses of randomized control trials. So. 
And we also have um, clinical trials practices, and the World Health Organization defines a clinical trial as any research study that prospectively assigns human participants or groups of humans to one or more health-related interventions to evaluate the effects on health outcomes. And um, the objective is to produce evidence on whether or not an intervention works within certain conditions. And clinical, cl clinical trials are used in research and development of pharmaceuticals, medical devices, or other procedures. But we do see these most often applied in pharmaceuticals. And uh, clinical trials have uh, typically four phases. And the World Health Organization outlines um, four phases here that many of you are probably familiar with already. Phase one, looking at testing with small groups, um, initial safety evaluation, identifying side effects, initial dosage ranges. Uh, phase two is looking at testing with uh, larger groups, um, evaluating efficacy and safety, um, often using randomization and controls in some of these studies. Uh, phase three is looking at uh, testing with even larger groups uh, with randomization, comparing a new intervention with another intervention, for example, the standard of care. And finally, uh, phase four is post-market evaluation of an approved intervention, and it really is examining the effectiveness um, within a large population and to monitor for adverse effects. So when we think about um, the uh, consequences of not shifting our approaches um, at, for, for now with um, technology-based interventions. Um, some of the consequences um, are, oops, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, sorry. Um, some of the issues, backtracking a little bit here, I got ahead of myself. Okay, so um, some of the issues with our current approaches is that um, through our experiences and from the literature that we've reviewed and also from um, experiences of others, um, we are finding that current approaches are often inappropriate, unfeasible, and too slow for technology-based interventions. And some of the issues that we've um, outlined um, uh, in our paper are uh, seven uh, different um, concerns. And so uh, firstly, some of the interventions have obvious and observable benefits. And so we don't need to have um, the types of studies such as randomized control trials to be able to define um, what some of these benefits might be. Um, findings um, from uh, some of the research methods um, that are existing um, have limited generalizability to real world contexts and many of those uh, concerns relate to the extent where we have to control different factors um, um, and the heterogeneity of the population um, in order to do um, uh, testing. And so what ends up happening is the findings might not necessarily translate to the clients or the individuals who we're working with. Um, often there's an over-reliance on group means, um, which overlook valuable individual responses or characteristics that influence outcomes. Uh, we also um, have heterogeneity in our populations, which is a reality in rehabilitation. Um, so we often have um, small groups of individuals with um, diverse needs and diverse um, experiences, but also diverse abilities. And so being able to create a or select for a very homogeneous sample to be able to conduct a trial with um, uh, with a control group might be very difficult to achieve in large sample sizes. Um, often with um, existing methodology or existing study designs, um, lifelong use and impact are not often considered. Um, a lot of the interventions that we have um, in uh, technology-based interventions are um, needing to have an extended period of time for evaluation to look at the benefits and harms. Uh, cost and funding challenges is um, a concern across the board, but some study designs are actually um, much more costly um, to uh, carry out. And there is a concern about uh, being able to um, conduct the right type of research um, with um, matching the research questions with the uh, study designs in order to minimize resource waste. Um, and also, particularly with um, rapidly um, advancing technology, there's also a necessity for efficiency and expediency um, to match with that uh, technology change. 
So now going back to the slide that I was talking about before. Um, so what are the consequences of not shifting our approaches? Um, so I'd mentioned already wasted resources on opportunities, which potentially means that interventions could be poorly developed or evaluated and lack generalizability to user populations. Um, Interventions may not be developed or translated to those who need them. So generating evidence might take too long, is too expensive, or is not providing useful data uh, for us to advance our practices or to um, allow benefit for um, the users. Um, another concern is that there's a persistent and significant knowledge translation gap, and others have reported that implementation of evidence-based interventions from bench to bedside is about 17 years, and that is, um, very, quite frankly, far too slow um, for most interventions, um, but for technology-based interventions, as things are evolving very quickly, that is very slow. So um, some of the other consequences are that um, we maintain unattainable standards of evidence for our field in disability and rehabilitation. Um, we may have a constant loss of solutions and opportunities. So things that might be very innovative um, may not be implemented into practice or may not be funded. Um, there's a persistent lack of clinical guidance um, for technology-based interventions, um, which clinicians will rely on to be able to um, make recommendations or the best recommendations for their clients, and also a perpetual lag in funding uh, policies and practices as well. So I'm going to pause there um, to see whether or not there's any questions from the audience. Thank you, Rosalie. I'm not seeing anyone's hand up. Um, if anyone has a question, they can go ahead and unmute themselves. Uh, a question or even a comment. All right, is this resonating with you? I know for me, I'm so excited about your perspectives. And uh, this is something that I think many of us have been waiting for. Your, your collective has put into words and into a framework, the concerns that we've heard for many, many years. So thank you for that. Um, does anyone else have a comment at this point or should we continue on? Okay, we'll continue on then, Rosalie. Thank you. Okay, good. And also feel free to pop some queries into the chat um, if you would like as well. And we can take it up at the next um, interval. Oh. Um, all right, so thinking about the concerns that we talked about already, we came up with FASTER as an alternative approach, and I do also like to acknowledge um, Lynn's comment. Um, a lot of the sort of discussion has been sort of swirling around in the rehabilitation field and actually other uh, fields as well, um, as diverse as psychiatry, mental health, and uh, surgery, um, that our current approaches might not be working for us. And um, of course, um, I do acknowledge that a lot of this discussion um, in, and some of the uh, topics here that we're proposing in um, our framework has been discussed in the, in the literature um, uh, in the past in different fields. And I think um, the critical point that we are at right now is trying to bring all of this um, content together um, in sort of a more rehab and disability focus um, to hopefully really initiate some conversations about how we can move forward and um, shift the paradigm, potentially advance sort of areas that might not have been discussed as much um, in the past. Um, but um, yeah, as a collective, we um, hopefully, and as a research uh, community, um, hopefully we can uh, move things forward. Um, yeah, so, okay. So this image is um, more, again, a depiction of our faster um, uh, of the framework and some of the phases I've already described, but I'll go into more detail. And uh, the addition in this image really is some of the outputs that we expect from each of the different um, uh, phases. And again, this is uh, an image of um, sort of the overall picture, and I will dive into each of the elements um, a little bit more. 
Um, so we created FASTER um, in order to provide guidance for technology developers, researchers, clinicians, and others uh, when developing and evaluating technology-based interventions. And um, just from some of the conversations that I've had uh, from people who have contacted me after our paper was published, um, it does seem to be resonating with others who are not necessarily looking at technology uh, development, but for um, other types of intervention development. And so we're really happy to, to hear that people are um, interested in, in this sort of beyond, you know, our initial idea of technology based interventions. So um, it is a three phased approach um, that's informed um, by established innovation design processes, for example, design thinking, um, and also complex interventions development um, and implementation. And for anybody who is following the uh, Medical Research Council's complex interventions guidance, um, just this past September, they've released a um, revamped version. And I'm really, really excited to read more about um, uh, their processes as well, because they essentially were the group that sort of um, really started digging deeper into the idea of complex interventions. And over time, they've really shifted um, um, ideas um, to really include complex systems. And that's an area that is really fascinating to me. Um, so if anybody is interested in diving into complex interventions, um, please have a look at uh, their materials. It's very exciting stuff. Um, and also uh, to note that um, I'm excited because some of the um, um, updates and revisions that they have in their guidance um, is sort of falling, uh, our work is sort of um, falling in line with some of the work that they've um, uh, identified as well as um, ways in which we can move forward. And so it is very exciting that um, it's sort of coming together really nicely in that sense. So. Um, we also include um, guiding principles that we feel need to be consciously and proactively embedded throughout the development and evaluation process. Um, and we all also um, provide a selection of research methods and designs that potentially can align really well with creating technology based interventions um, and clinical evidence. And I'll review some of those uh, very shortly. So before we go into um, the principles and the phases, I'd like to stress some important features of the FASTER approach. And so we emphasize iterative and rapid intervention prototyping. So within all of the different phases, we're looking at evaluating prototypes that may not necessarily be complete, um, but we want to evaluate iteratively to ensure that we're getting feedback from users and the contexts in which uh, they might use the interventions. And so that, um, user engagement aspect is really, really critical for the work that we're doing. Um, um, and also iterative testing, um, also with users in small scale studies during all of the different phases. So with users, we want active inclusion of heterogeneous groups during development and evaluation. And so we want the diversity um, and the different uh, voices and experiences within the development process to make the intervention as relevant as possible to um, the uh, clients that we see and for the potential users. Um, and finally, we like to see early deployment and scaled and replicated evaluation of interventions in real world environments. Um, in the past, it has really been a lot of uh, technical development um, and with very little sort of integration of user uh, perspectives. And that is really shifting in the technology development world, but it also is something that we really do need to stress. We can design and design until something is technically almost perfect, but once we bring it out to users for them to, to test out and also to look at in their environments, um, it potentially could fail because it hasn't integrated those perspectives and contexts. All right, so, um, we have laid out four guiding principles and the three um, uh, which are user engagement, transdisciplinary and transsectoral working and ethical practices are um, conceptualized to be um, at the core of the three phases of FASTER. And so the fourth is really um, process evaluation and re reporting to support transparency. 
and um, activities related to this principle occur outside of all of the phases and, for example, evaluates how well our processes um, are um, at achieving the outcomes that we want at every stage. And transparency, of course, is uh, critical to demonstrate how we arrived at our development and evaluation decisions. Um, I don't have time to really go through all of the different um, guiding principles, but um, in our paper, we've um, detailed um, some of the key points related to um, each of the guiding principles and also um, refers readers uh, to more resources that they can um, explore further um, in terms of um, each of these different principles. So um, I'm going to take another pause here to see if there are any questions. Well, I see there's a few comments in the chat. Okay. So one of the questions is where is the paper published and can people have access to it? Um, we did um, include a link in the notice that went out to people. Um, if you don't have access to it, you can write to the Pearl team and we can send it to you individually um, for sure. Excellent. Um, Rosalie, I have a question for you. Many mm -hmm. people who are uh, with us today are from places in the Global South and particularly um, Africa. Has, has your collective done any work uh, with users in Africa? Uh, not yet. Not All right. Yet. Yeah. Um, our extended networks definitely have, um, but um, our sort of um, core collective right now has not. Um, but it is certainly an opportunity that we would welcome just because we are um, really excited about um, you know, topics related to how we can actually implement different types of um, interventions um, where it best matches the um, environments. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's exciting times in terms of um, where interventions and technology can go, but also um, we really do need to be able to match the intervention design to the context and the users. Exactly. So, you know, the, the guiding principles of user engagement and making sure that users are involved from the very beginning of a process and that it's transdisciplinary, transsectoral, people from different backgrounds, um, and that it's ethical um, seem to be very relevant, even in a context where there is not a lot of uh, let's say technology, high tech technology. Um, a lot of the technology might be lower tech or even not. I mean, I, I often think of technology as being everything that we use, not just the robots and the electronic devices. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's there's a lot of um, different forms of technology. Um, yeah, I absolutely agree. And um, I, I was as I was reviewing um, just now the um, image with all of the different types of interventions for rehabilitative assistive and service delivery, I just realized that I was quite um, on, a, on a specific track when I selected those images, because, um, of course, the idea of technology based interventions is a lot broader. Um, and for some reason, I selected all of the robotic technologies. It must have been my frame <laughs> of mind at the time when I was putting this together. We, we might invite you back to talk about that uh, aspect of your background, because I know you've done some really interesting work, but maybe we should move on. Thank you. <laughs> um, now, um, there were a few uh, comments in the chat that I'm just going to quickly scan through. Um, okay. Okay, web accessibility. Um, yes, that's definitely an area that we can, um, that this potentially could be um, relevant for. Um, research not reaching those who really need it. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's consistent across a lot of different settings. Oh, thank you. I'm excited about this too. <laughs> Uh, my question is more uh, the field of technology and that uh, field of technology that the evidence apply that should be a bit 
be digital technology, computers, or physical that don't require computers? I think that question might be about the range of technology that we were just talking about, and mm. that it's it's not only about digital technology uh, or or complex robotic technology. Um, this framework can apply to any technologies. Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely great feedback because, as I say, I was quite on a track when I was selecting those, and um, yeah, making sure that I I am much more inclusive in um, the discussion about the different kinds of technologies. Yeah, for sure. Um, where is the paper published? Yes, we address that. And con are there any context specific bearing on the work? Okay, yeah. Okay, yes, again, um, our uh, collective so far um, hasn't specifically done a lot of work with um, low and middle income countries, but of course, um, yeah, our networks, our extended net networks definitely have. And um, yeah, I think it would be really, really good to sort of um, explore um, those kinds of um, contexts um, uh, a little bit more and thinking about, you know, the sort of premise of being able to ensure that we have interventions that ulti ultimately make it to the hands of the users, um, definitely something we can explore further. Yeah. Any idea could be contextual? Yes. I, I think we've addressed most of the questions that are in the chat and I'll keep my eye on it uh, going forward as well. Okay, fantastic. Yes. Um, all right, so um, so the next section here, we're going to sort of do a quick drive by of the different phases. <laughs> and so I'll be talking about each phase, um, what might entail be um, involved in each of the phases, um, the research methods, um, and also um, some of the outcomes from each of the different phases. So um, again, bearing in mind, this is a really sort of um, broad overview of the framework itself, and um, more details will be available in the paper. And um, Pooja and I are also working on a follow up paper to this looking at um, uh, sort of integration into market and developing um, technologies and interventions so that they are able to be matched to the market and what the market needs. So a, a different sort of um, adventure in that direction, but Pooja is um, really becoming an international expert in this area. So it's really fantastic um, to, to be able to sort of move in those directions and explore some of these things. So. Um, so, um, for all of the three phases, um, we call these broad um, activity phases, um, but they really are iterative, and um, you may be working back and forth between phases throughout the process of creating technology-based interventions. Um, but ultimately, at the end, you would hope that, um, or we would hope that you have an intervention that is ready for use and able to be integrated into practice. So phase one, um, which is shown on this slide here, is the development phase. And um, here we're applying, um, we've selected design thinking as a possible approach to understand and create solutions to a problem. Um, so we've specifically sort of identified and um, you know, other development teams may not use the same uh, development approach, but this is uh, one example of um, design thinking that we thought um, works quite nicely. Um, so um, Stanford's D School, which outlines the design modes of empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. Um, it's the one that we sort of selected um, uh, to illustrate our sort of development phase here. Um, we also um, align these modes with critical elements in complex intervention development uh, described by Bleichenberg and colleagues in 2018. And so um, the different um, elements within that complex intervention development um, is indicated here as well. Um, so needs determination, practice context examination, align well with the mode of empathize and evidence identification aligns nicely with um, define um, in the uh, design thinking uh, framework or um, approach and ideate um, 
also aligns nicely with um, theory inclusion and process outcomes and modeling. And so um, there are some really nice uh, synergies here potentially um, in terms of um, bringing different perspectives together. So um, design thinking is really the design community often applied in industry, engineering, computer science development, um, and the complex intervention development really is um, coming from a very clinical sort of perspective. And so uh, merging those uh, domains is really, really um, um, important because we want to create an integrated type of intervention. Um, okay, and so we list here as well um, some research methods and designs that uh, might be suitable for this early development phase. And so things, um, approaches like qualitative or quantitative or mixed approaches um, are important. We also look at descriptive observational studies, case reports, and single subject research designs as um, options uh, within this early development uh, phase. So some of the outputs that we anticipate um, for phase one in development is um, a systematically and comprehensively developed and documented intervention along with delivery processes and also some preliminary user feedback to refine the intervention and delivery processes. And um, this slide is, uh, the, this next slide is just a reminder about how important it is to um, incorporate existing evidence um, and theory in design, in designing a technology-based intervention. So in these um, scenarios, we are, as I mentioned, bridging engineering and clinical sciences and creating an intervention. And so we're not looking at something that is just technically able to address the problem, but also looking at the clinical practices and the knowledge or treatment theories that we need to understand pin the intervention. And so something that is noted to be missing in a lot of the literature on interventions is how they're developed and what explanatory models are behind the interventions. And so um, in terms of you know, areas where we can really um, um, enhance what we're doing really is being able to document the background of how interventions were developed. Um, phase two looks at progressive usability and feasibility evaluation. And um, this is where we're looking at intervention prototypes that are evaluated um, at a small scale uh, with users, ideally in real world settings. And we envision multiple study approaches and designs that are used um, in one study or a series of studies looking at usability and feasibility outcomes. And thinking about the research methods and designs, um, we are adding more options in terms of designs. So looking at potentially interrupted time series designs, um, one group pretest post-test designs, non-equivalent pretest post-test control group designs, and stepped wedge trial designs and randomized control trials. I apologize. I think I will let the dog out. Okay. All right. So some of the um, outputs um, that we foresee in this phase are a comprehensive understanding of the users, the intervention and delivery processes and use contexts, and evidence for usability and feasibility and more feedback in order to refine the intervention and evaluation processes. So in this final phase, um, so phase three, we're looking at um, scaled evaluation and implementation. And so this is, um, we're envisioning a progressively scaled up set of studies of the intervention with deployment with users in real world contexts, again, and studies and replications of the study with various user groups, clinician characteristics, care contexts, and geographical locations to create a robust body of evidence. And again, we've um, added more research methods and designs here. Um, so things like um, step wedge uh, trial designs, oh, we've included that before, uh, tracker trials, pragmatic trials, and practice or program-based evidence as well. And again, um, there are some references in the uh, paper um, if you want to further explore what some of these um, designs are. 
So in phase three, um, our outputs um, are evidence for short and long-term use, um, effectiveness, abandonment, and the impacts uh, of use on functional participation, social and economic outcomes. And we also expect cumulative evidence from multiple studies um, on the impacts of the intervention to support broad implementation, in addition to further evidence to refine the intervention and delivery. So this is um, the last bit here, um, just a note about research methods and designs. Um, we are emphasizing diverse methods and designs. And so really um, no single research method and design is universally suitable and effective. Um, whatever approach we select really must match the study goals and the research questions and the maturity of the intervention that's being developed um, and evaluated. Um, and of course, all methods and designs have strengths and weaknesses, and these need to be considered when we're interpreting our findings. Um, but overall, cumulative evidence from multiple diverse studies can lend credibility and generalizability to the interventions. So um, I've just posted up some questions here, um, hopefully to sort of um, you know, potentially get some discussion going, but something potentially also to reflect on. Um, so what um, does the faster approach resonate with the research and development that you're doing? Why or why not? Um, what elements might be important but missing in our discussion so far? Um, what might be some of the barriers to adopting alternative approaches? And what do you think might facilitate the adoption of alternative approaches that we may not have considered? Uh, what opportunities do you see to apply alternative approaches such as FASTER? And what do you think uh, should be next steps as we progress? So I will stop talking now um, and see if there are any questions. Thank you, Rosalie. Um, an excellent overview. I think we can take away, you know, something about the three phases and the outcomes. And uh, I'll just remind people that um, this information is in the paper. We will share the recording of this of today's webinar because I know there were a lot of terms and ideas that Rosalie shared. Each one of them could be another hour or more in, in discussion. Um, so I certainly have some comments, um, but I'll wait to see if anyone else um, would like to say something have a question. Uh, I know that we do have several people from Bamenda and um, in Cameroon. Uh, one of the things that I was happy to hear you talk about was abandonment, because that has been something that I think sometimes is forgotten. And uh, one of the situations that we know about in, in the Northwest region of Cameroon is that People often bring technologies without thinking about um, how it's going to be followed up and supported. So we know that there are cupboards full of wheelchairs that are not effective um, and hearing aids that are not effective, um, various things like that. So I think this kind of framework will help people think through the process of introducing and following up. Uh, with, with technologies. The special needs entrepreneur group in particular is doing some interesting work on uh, development of, of supports, devices, technologies. Um, I think there might be a couple of people here today who are involved with them, but yeah, if anyone wants to go ahead and make a comment, please do. We also have some engineers in the audience. Great engineer friends. <laughs> so, so there's a question. Uh, I've been working around social inclusion. I think meaning working in the area of social inclusion and wondering if the development of technology replaces the social component or is considered in its development. I think you touched on that in the very beginning. Maybe you'd like to just go back to how important your team understands social, the social aspects, learning, networking, all of those kinds of things. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, absolutely. Um, social aspects are so, so critical to the whole entire um, process. Um, 
just in terms of um, our networking and interactions are really the sort of uh, sources for our information of, you know, I, I think when we talk about um, um, ethics, um, there's discussion about, you know, our selection of topics to address, there's a justice element to that in addition to the ethical elements of, you know, the process of developing. And so I, th I think um, when, when we talk about um, user engagement, um, looking at development that is um, incorporating people's environments and social environments, uh, all of those aspects are enfolded into the, the process. And it's not always easy to sort of tease out or to be able to apply things in practice all the time, um, but it is critical, like the social um, elements are critical for every stage, like considering what we develop and how we develop it um, and how it's going to be implemented. So, um, and yes, so in terms of a process, social inclusion is critical for the whole enterprise, but in terms of the outcomes, social inclusion is also important because ultimately we want our interventions to be able to support people to do what they would um, do, what they value, but also to be included in their communities and be, for them to be able to participate in the activities that they want to participate in. And yes, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> yeah, I, I, th I think, you know, that's the whole point of having technologies really is that people can, can participate, be included, feel included. Um, it does lead to another question that was posed, um, which is around the funding required. And I think, I mean, I'll just give a reflection. Um, one of the things that's exciting to me about your FASTER framework is that it appears to be much less costly than the traditional evidence-based running RCTs and kind of um, approaches. Doesn't mean that there isn't a cost. There would still be a cost to developing new interventions. Um, but maybe you can say a little bit about um, costing and how your collective has thought about um, funding and, and finances. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it all goes back to um, complexity as well. So depending on what kind of, you know, intervention we're trying to develop, um, some interventions will be a lot costlier than others in terms of just um, the development process. So if we're thinking about something that's very complex and potentially dangerous, so I'm thinking about a robotic exoskeleton that is actually in direct contact and manipulating somebody's um, uh, limbs, that would be something that requires um, in terms of upfront development cost um, and evaluation would be quite high cost. Um, other things, um, you know, even if we think about something that potentially could be safer, um, so some of the sort of um, assistive devices that uh, don't have electronics um, incorporated into it, uh, that development cost might be um, less. Um, but what we are sort of moving in the direction of as well, and um, this is uh, also the topic of the follow-up paper that Pooja and I are working on is looking at um, um, lean development. And so her experience with lean startup uh, really is trying to sort of, you know, generate the, um, you know, the most beneficial um, intervention, um, getting as much user feedback along the way as possible in order to really streamline the development so that it is trying to match the user's needs and the market's needs um, as we go along, rather than sort of in this very, um, you know, potentially less user integrated sort of way of, you know, coming up with a solution, developing it until we think theoretically and technically it works really well, and then getting feedback and trying to sort of fit within a mold of, um, you know, the, the hierarchy of study designs and trying to sort of test things where it might not actually answer the questions that we really want for implementation. And so looking at, you know, lean startup methodologies might be a potential way of sort of trying to pare down costs, but really, really target um, the process so that we end up with a solution that is um, feasible and desirable by um, the users and potentially has an opportunity to, to um, do well in the market, so. Thanks, Rosalie. 
Um, I'm wondering if we can if we can take the focus not so much on high tech, high cost technologies, but think about um, new way, like let's get into some of the specifics of how a group might use this framework if they wanted to try out a low cost technology in their community. Could you walk us through that a little bit, please? I think those are the kinds of questions we're seeing in the chat. Mm -hmm. how, okay. do we, how do we use this framework if we don't have a lot of money? Um, so I, I think it really is, um, it's, it's, we're hoping, and we might get some feedback on this as well, that it would be um, um, a flexible approach that isn't necessarily um, specific to any type of technology. It, potentially can be, um, you know, the, the starting point for development um, might be identification of a problem. Um, and when we sort of work through the development process and engaging users, you really, really are, you know, able to get an understanding of what the um, users um, have concerns with, what might be sort of the con contextual factors. And so if, um, you know, um, environments that might not be accessible or um, technology or interventions might not necessarily be readily um, um, able to be um, brought in or created within a local community. Um, you know, it's open to the idea of a solution that might be, you know, created um, with whatever resources are available. And so the design thinking process isn't necessarily committed to any type of um, technology intervention per se. It really is coming up with solutions that um, uh, fit within the environment. Um, so walking through sort of the development um, aspect of that, um, you evaluate um, with the users what might be possible. And that doesn't um, preclude, um, it could be possible that it would be um, an intervention where um, uh, family members can, you know, look at um, a set of instructions and make it themselves at home with existing materials. And so we have um, an example actually of um, um, the hero glove that one of our, that Aaron Yerkowicz actually, who is part of the collective, um, he has developed a um, technology that potentially could be developed with sort of, um, it is a robotic glove, but there are instructions that are freely available online for you to purchase the um, components and make it yourself at home. And um, in terms of cost uh, for um, creating uh, the materials, I believe it's less than $100 for the parts themselves. And so um, options like that of, you know, developing something that somebody can actually just look at the, you know, instructions, download them, and be able to get the parts and make it at home um, and test it out. That is something that um, can be included in this process as well. Um, in terms of you know, looking at um, evaluation or further testing, um, there's lots of different sort of options in terms of how we can rigorously test an intervention that's created um, or developed in phase one. So um, I don't know if that answers the question. Um, Thank you. I think it's it's a great start and a good example. I think it's when people see the actual examples or hear about examples and actually walk through uh, the examples that, you know, we realize you're not proposing a particular technology. You're proposing a way of evaluating and, and thinking about how is that technology being used or um, you know, how well, what's the evidence for its use? And I think what you're saying is that we really need to look beyond RCTs, randomized controlled trial studies and systematic reviews, because there just isn't the evidence there. And there shouldn't be, there, it's not possible, <laughs> right? For many of the devices um, and technologies that, that we use. Um, there's an interesting question about, um, environmental issues. And to me, I, I, we're almost out of time, but um, I think 
in phase one, as the group comes together to consider things um, and user experience is involved in that, you could certainly have lots of discussion about environmental issues and make that a part of what the team is working on. I see you nodding your head. Yeah, it is 100% something that is critical um, because you can develop an intervention that works um, in terms of efficacy in a very controlled environment. But once you, you know, get it out into the field in real world settings, um, we want to be able to anticipate what some of those environmental conditions that support or uh, create barriers for um, use. And, and we want to be looking for environmentally um, friendly technologies. We need to, it, it, we, we absolutely have to be. Rosalie, I really wanna thank you very, very much for today's session. Um, you have generously shared your time, excellent presentation. Uh, we'll close the um, webinar now officially but we'll stay online for a few more minutes if people want to have some informal discussion. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much for inviting me. And um, I've just put up some contact information here. Um, of course, you can email me at my um, UToronto email as well. But if you want to direct it to the Faster Collective, we have an email and you can check out our website as well. So thank you so much for um, uh, the time uh, to present and also for um, participating and hopefully we will have some opportunity to collaborate at some point in time. So, thank, thank you, you Rosalie and we look forward to part two. In a <laughs> thank you. All right, great.